how can water store memory? This is, they say, oh, this is rubbish. Because the idea that liquid water updates its information every trillionth, trillionth of a second. So, you know, how is it even interested in someone's conscious expression or its environment or any of these things? It's in molecular chaos. And I used to talk about that. And I'm like, well, and I used to wonder myself, it's like, well, if water is this chaotic state, how is it going to receive information? How is that possible? And so my friend Dave, he said, you know, there's a big difference between molecular chaos and molecular excitement. And I'm like, all right, that really made sense to me because when you're excited, you're usually excited about something. So he explained a little bit more about what that means. And hopefully I'm able to kind of translate some of his quantum physics speaks into my own sort of um, way of talking uh, through the presentation. You know what, this, this image right here, this was from my last masterclass where I used the word Mary Magdalene. And this image actually appeared just in case anyone was wondering, because it looks like an, it looks like oil but it's, it's just really remarkable. Mm. So this idea here of transference in the context of water, I'm saying that transference is when there is a transfer of physical, telepathic, or energetic information through the liquid stage of water, which can be identified when a relative image forms in the ice. And we often call this water memory. For some people, that image is geometric for me that image is three things there is a signature pattern so different waters hold their own identifiable signature pattern which I'll show you soon there is the art which I'm more well known for <clears throat> and then there is um hydroglyphs which I've got a lot of photographs for and I have mentioned that before as well the hydroglyphs uh, this, this picture here on the right was the first picture I ever took after seeing a bit of fluff floating around in the water before. And my idea was that I was going to project a thought into the water. And as I was thinking about what I was going to think about, I put my hand in to take the fluff out, consciously thought, I wonder if my hand will have any impact on the water's quote unquote memory, because I genuinely didn't know if that was real. And I was trying to discover for myself if it was. Um, you might notice it looks kind of different than my other work and that's because it's completely frozen solid and I have not frozen water solid in nine years and I've been doing this quite some time. So mm. when I put a sunflower seed into the water and then removed it and then put it into the freezer, used my short-term freezing method, which takes around about five minutes and 20 seconds, where there is liquid on top and ice underneath, and I tip the liquid away, and I photographed the remaining crystallography. What's so interesting is that the image in the ice designed the sunflower. So what it did was see the potential within the seed and designed the fruit or the outcome of it. And that's whenever I'm putting things into water or, or showing the water an image or any of these things, I usually leave it for 30 seconds. That seems to be my kind of time frame that I use for most of my work. There is no specific reason for that other than it's not too long and not too short. Then I always remove the Petri dish from the pitcher or take the thing that I've put into it out before I put it into the freezer and then I time it for around five minutes 20 seconds when there's liquid on top ice underneath tip the liquid away and photograph the remaining ice that is on the petri dish so this is macroscopic we can see it with our naked eye this is an iconic photo where I put the petri dish of water on top of my friend Wendy's face removed it froze it and you can see it designed that but you know what is an interesting thing is that then I did the same thing using this picture so I kind of showed water the ice image to see what it would do and it designed a replica like a negative of the face so I think that this is really interesting because you can see that there is a clear recognition and pattern happening and a lot of things that happen within the water science community or for sciences in the repeatability. And 
So I've got repeatability of symbols um, within the hydroglyphs, but it's interesting to see the repeatability here of pictures. So when I wrote the word conception, I wrote it on a little piece of paper, put it under my Petri dish, left it there for 30 seconds, removed, froze, and it designed what very much looks like sperm and an egg. So, well, how would water know what conception is? Like how, and, and even just getting their head around that, like how would water know anything, right? But then if you look at indigenous wisdom and you understand that there is this idea that water is just not, uh, we have this saying, water is life. But in some people's belief systems, they would say that water is alive. And the de definition of alive isn't quite what we might think it is. It's actually something that's uh, moving, something that um, has, has life. And so there's these ideas, if we look at water, it's moving, it has life. It's often called living water. And so, so what people always ask about different languages, here is in Japanese, the mm -hmm. word for snow and the result. Wait, um, now one question uh, Mary asked is, what is the difference whether you use spring water or tap water or distilled water? Yeah, well, again, there there is a difference. Um, I, I don't recommend using distilled water at all because distilled water essentially isn't holding the minerals. It's not holding the salts. And I actually think it's the salts and minerals that help the water to be an active participant. Um, it's, it's an interesting one. I think of distilled water like the observer and I think of spring water like, like us. We are the active participant. We're able to store memories, but we're also able to observe ourselves. We have all of the abilities in one. And I think that has something to do with the fact that we have salts and minerals. Salts are crystals. Crystals store information. We use them in all of our technology. And we are an ocean. We're salt water. And so there is, I, I think that there's a, very big connection between the salts and memory, if you will. Yeah, I just want to comment as you talked about the minerals and the mineral water, the indigenous often call the, the womb, the amniotic fluid in the womb as the first ocean because it is the salt water. It is as closest to the water in the sea. And that's where we all are gestated and birth is in those minerals and that water, which is the seawater oceans. So I was very, very interested to know more about amniotic fluid. And since I wasn't able to easily have access to that, I wanted to think, well, what else is there? So I thought, well, eggs might be a good one. Egg white is kind of like an amniotic fluid. It's super simple. If you guys can do it, I actually um, have taught lots and lots of people. So you, you get a free range fresh egg. If you can, that's the, where you're going to actually find this works best. You carefully crack it. So I'm going to, so you can see what I'm kind of doing. You carefully crack the egg and you have a bowl and you have a glass Petri dish. I only use glass Petri dishes. Glass is mostly made of silica. Silica is a type of crystal. It helps water to store information for longer. Don't use plastic. So um, you crack the egg. Um, you do it over a bowl, but you crack it very carefully so it's not fully open and you let that first like sal saliva like but just trickle out you'll find it as you play with the eggs and you just get as much of that thin fluid as you can into the dish you put it into the freezer and freeze it for about 10 minutes and then you photograph what you see and you will be amazed it's like it's like magic honestly and it's and and it's it's consistent across the world as long as you have free range eggs yeah. A group of students were all encouraged to obtain one drop of water from the same body of water all at the same time. And through close examination of the individual droplets, um, you can see that each produced different images for each person. That's one person, second person, third person, fourth person, I think. That is another indicator to say that water has a relationship with us, relative to us. We've seen Luke Montenegro's work of DNA teleportation, if you will. And I think that 
I think his work is really profound and significant. <laughs> heard of this idea of a phantom limb. Well, they took these some dissected some parts of a leaf and rather than seeing the dissected parts the leaf actually the the um it was shown that the entirety of the leaf appeared with the pieces missing rather than the piece itself now i think this is very relative to the very first pictures i showed you where i'm putting a seed into the water and it's showing the potential i think that this is very very significant in relation to a lot of my work and other people's work now this only i i commend uh this uh, insight and commend your your extra extraordinary uh passionate uh, pursuit of truth beta i'm uh, just honored to be here with all so many beautiful people and always learning from you beta i'm well blessings to each of you all of us and until we meet again thank you Thank you so much, Veda. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. It's always, always my favorite topic.